Good morning. Um, I'm James Stevenson Wallace, Chief Executive of the Electricity Authority. Um, thank you for joining us this morning for the release of the review of competition in the wholesale electricity market. In terms of approach to the presentation this morning, I'll run through a presentation for about 25 minutes and then open uh, to question and answers. I'm supported here today uh, by a number of the Electricity Authority staff who have been working on the review and I may defer to them to assist in answering some of the questions. So March 21, the Authority announced a review of competition in the wholesale market. This review was initiated in response to elevated spot prices that have been a feature of the market since the unplanned outage of Paakura in spring 2018. The review moves beyond the government's previous electricity pricing review to examine generators' profitability and examines key events that have challenged the performance of the sector in recent years. In 2021, we've had continued elevated prices in the forward and spot markets, and this is in the context of low inflows, gas shortages, and low wind levels. And more recently, on the 9th of August, there was a power blackout, a subsequent undesirable trading situation claim, and continued rhetoric about the potential for the market being broken. This has placed increased scrutiny and interest in the potential outcomes stemming from this review. In terms of the approach that we'll be running through, uh, the review is in two parts. So we have the release of the review into competition in the wholesale markets and the release of an issues paper on the potential issues of inefficient price discrimination and possible responses. The authority is focused on the long-term interests of consumers and our work so seeks to support an efficient, affordable and stable transition to a low emissions economy. The review today is central to that work and establishing with the market settings will support that transition. The approach looks at the market from the perspective of structure, conduct and performance covering the period from January 2019 to June 2021. Simply put, under this analytical approach, the structure of the market influences the conduct of its participants and their conduct drives performance of the market. Efficient performance should lead to prices that reflect the true cost of producing electricity and ensures consumers consume the right amount of electricity themselves. We want to get electricity to those people and firms with the highest value uses, whether that's heating homes, manufacturing products or running businesses. From the authority's perspective, it's important that we collect feedback on our analysis, the indicators that we've used, the tests and the various observations that we have made. The issues paper identifies possible policy responses, and the authority is seeking feedback on which option, if any, to progress. And I'll just emphasise at this po point in time, no single policy option is being proposed. The reports are based on the information currently available to the authority and are subject to consultation. We are seeking to gather better and more information on broader issues in the electricity market by hearing directly from interested parties. And I note that some of the options presented in the issues paper extend beyond the authority's remit and would require initiation and support from wider government. So whilst we've flagged these options, we're not exploring those in detail in the issues paper. Turning first to the review paper, the review explored competition in the wholesale spot markets between 2018 and 2021. During the period, prices have been high since the Paakura outage in 2018. The review observed that elevated prices do not always match underlying supply and demand conditions. And at times, the markup of price overcost is at times high, though noting this is sensitive, sensitive to the cost and assumptions used. There is some evidence that market power may have been exercised through economic withholding. However, different indicators provide conflicting views. We've also found that there have been factors holding back investment, but some of these seem to be clearing and improving. One of the most pressing observations that the review makes is that the contracts between Meridian, Contact and the New Zealand aluminium smelters reached in January 2021 caused a sharp increase in forward prices and that the price discrimination implicit in those contracts raises the possibility that electricity may not be going to the highest value use. The issues paper, which is the second of our two papers I'll talk to shortly, outlines the potential inefficient price discrimination issues and proposes possible solutions for the purpose of seeking feedback from interested parties. The authority has prioritised this issue as there appears to be sufficient evidence to indicate potential material implications for consumers and for generators. The second paper also relates to the observations from a review about high prices and barriers to investment in renewable generation.
Looking at the period from January 2019 to March 21, prices have been elevated. This chart shows the sustained upward shift in average spot prices from the time of the Pohokura outage, and I'd refer specifically to the pink bar. Prices rose in response to the outage and have been, on average, above $100 a megawatt hour since then. For comparison, this, the average spot price from 2009 to the Pohokura outage was $67 a megawatt hour. Prices have, at least to some extent, reflected supply and demand conditions, which is a sign of competition. At times, we have seen low hydro inflows and low storage. There have been several gas production outages, and all fuel costs have been rising during this period, including the value of stored water and the costs associated with carbon emissions. However, some of the increase in price since 2018 appears to be unexplained by the underlying conditions. This could be because it is difficult to account for all underlying conditions or due to data limitations, or that the prices are not being determined competitively. We know that the recent elevated spot prices have, at least to some part, been driven by gas supply issues and corresponding gas prices. The elevated spot prices reflect uncertainty in gas supply that we have faced since the 2018 outage and the overall decline in production from existing fields. During the outage, output from Pohokura reduced to close to half and subsequently, as shown in the top chart, there have been other outages and ongoing decline in output from other major fields. The review identifies that gas supply issues may be impacting electricity spot prices in both the medium term and also triggering short term fluctuations. This plus the increased cost of carbon reflects in thermal offers and also influences hydro offers as well. The tight supply conditions could continue into 2022 and there is a, this is expected to contribute to high wholesale gas prices. However, a recent report from the gas industry company indicates that the tight conditions could ease from 2023 to 24, but this is based on planned investment at various fields to bring the gas production to market. In terms of conduct, the review looked at the behaviour by generators. Since 2018, we observed that offer prices have increased, that a larger proportion of offers sit above costs for some generators, and that for some offers, they do not reflect underlying demand and supply conditions at the time. There is some evidence of increased incentive for generators to structure offers in a way that keep prices high. This refers to economic withholding, where generators offer some quantity of generation at such high prices that the generator expects it not to be dispatched for the purpose of reducing supply and increasing the spot price in the short term. This, however, is different from the accepted practice of pricing high to support fuel prioritisation. For example, to conserve water at times of low lake levels, reflecting this underlying scarcity. However, as we point out in the review, the different indicators we have used to reach this view provides conflicting views. Overall, while there can be good reasons for high offer prices for short periods of time, such as st to store water pending a planned outage, our interpretation is that the economic withholding may have been taking place at times during the period, and note that there may be instances in the past where the authority has also expressed concern about that conduct. Our analysis does not show any definitive evidence that generators were operating outside the rules of the code. I note that the new trading rules, which the authority introduced in June 2021, um, were put in place outside of this re review period. With these new rules in place, if we were to identify economic withholding, it would be appropriately enforced. The obligations would be appropriately enforced. Inve investment is central to supporting a affordable transition. Investment in low emissions generation is needed to displace legacy thermal plant, but is also important for security of supply and to balance demand and supply, maintaining downward pressure on prices over time. And the price signals for investment in the electrification of process heat and, transport and transportation also matter for an affordable transition to a low carbon future. The review observed that there are many build-ready investments in renewable energy as expected, Sorry, the review observed that there were not as many build-ready investments in the renewable energy uh, portfolio as expected. The forward price of electricity is now well above the cost of supplying new electricity, and this gap signals to the market that there is room for further investment in new generation. The review was informed by a series of interviews with a range of industry participants seeking to better understand the challenges and opportunities for the investment pipeline. 
Of the projects publicly signalled, only a small number have proceeded to commissioning. Factors that may have contributed to the thin pipeline of investment-ready projects include consenting delays or the need to update those consents, the need for large investment in transmission assets, and various policy regulatory and market uncertainties. Investment may also have been impacted by the structure of the market. There was a suggestion in some interviews that established generators may face different incentives to new entrants because they will rationally consider the effect of any new investment on the earnings on their existing portfolio of generation assets. The implication being that incumbents may be incentivised to delay investment in new assets to maximise the return on their existing portfolio as part of a rational commercial strategy. Some respondents have, however, suggested that some of the investment uncertainties are falling away, and in particular, uncertainty around TY seems to be less of an issue more recently. This is possibly because the market expects the smelter to stay or another major demand source to take its place. Respondents also indicate that the market for power purchase agreements, or PPAs, may be improving, which ushers the way for increased investment by independent generators. The review also considered key features of the structure of our current market. Generation in New Zealand is supplied primarily by four large generators, supplying about 80% of the market. Meridian has the largest generating capacity, with contact the next largest. As shown by this chart, it is important to note that while Meridian is not much larger in terms of generating capacity compared to the next largest generator, it is important to the market in terms of meeting demand is much larger. Specifically, Meridian has 30% of the market generating capacity from its South Island hydro generation, but is needed to meet demand over 90% of the time, and that has increased from around 77% in 2017. Contact has 22% of the market generating capacity, but is only needed to meet demand less than 40% of the time. So bringing this all together, whilst behaviour in the spot market has largely been consistent with the rules under the Electricity Act, we have seen evidence suggesting that the electricity may not be going to the highest value use and potentially at the expense of other consumers. Specifically, Meridian and Contact entered into contracts in relation to the supply of electricity at the smelter at TY Point on the 14th of January 21. The price movements in response to that announcement imply spot market costs to purchases are higher by between 1.6 billion and 2.6 billion over the next three years. This reflects an estimate in, of the increase in generated spot price revenues attributed to the smelter's decision to stay. The impact will ultimately be borne by consumers with an impact first on commercials and industrial consumers as their contracts are more closely linked to the spot prices then residential consumers through their contracts over time. The smelter is paying a significantly lower price than the rest of New Zealand and this low price raises the possibility that electricity is being allocated inefficiently. For TY, the contracts result in a low electricity price to the smelter of between $30 a megawatt hour and $40 a megawatt hour, compared to a national average of about $100, million, $100, megawatt, sorry, $100 a megawatt hour since 2018. The subsidisation of the smelter is estimated to be in excess of $500 million over the contract's four-year term. This figure is calculated as the difference between the price paid by the smelter and the increased cost incurred in servicing that supply to the smelter. The cost of the subsidy is offset by the impact of smelters' demand on increased national prices and spot market revenues to generators of an estimated $850 million per year. This is a particularly informative chart, which I'll just reflect on uh, as I go through. The chart illustrates the pronounced and immediate sensitivity of, market, of the market to stay or go decisions by the TY smelter. At 13% of national electricity demand, the TY contracts have significant implications for national prices, with a new contract impacting on revenue that all generators receive on their entire portfolio. The figure shows a timeline of TY announcements at the top and the impact of the arrangements on prices in the forward market, as shown below, indicating the potential impact on spot prices over the next two to three years. There were two announcements that triggered rises in the spot price, in particular, August 2020, where the smelter might stay, and in January 2021, where the smelter will stay and the contract is confirmed. 
The average increase in spot prices from these two announcements is in the range of $13 to $22 a megawatt hour, or 20% of the wholesale price at that time over three years. And that depends on whether you measure on the day of or the day after the announcement. The estimated scale of the potential inefficiency of the TY contracts could be potentially significant and may raise concerns that the generators are incentivised to subsidise the cost of electricity to the smelter through the TY contracts, particularly when the cost of the support is more than offset by the higher prices by all other, faced by all other consumers arising because of the increase in total demand in electricity. The authority is concerned that all consumers might be paying too much for their electricity because Meridian, supported by contact, appears to have sold electricity to the New Zealand aluminium smelter for $500 million less than it costs to produce. The arrangements could be wasteful. The subsidy maintains demand and keeps prices high in the wholesale market, and households might be individually paying up to $200 more per year as a result. Turning now to the second of the two papers released today, the Issues Paper. This is the first step in responding to the observations the Authority has made today. The Authority considers that, the one, considers that one of the most pressing observations in the review is the potential price discrimination implicit in the TY contracts, and it raises the possibility that electricity may not have been allocated efficiently. The issues paper directly addresses this observation, but also relates to observations about high prices and barriers to renewable generation investment. The paper also identifies possible policy responses for the purpose of consultation. We are seeking feedback on whether parties consider regulatory interventions needed to address efficiency concerns and on the authority's possible options explored in the paper. As mentioned in the introduction, some options may extend beyond the authority's remit and would require initiation and support from wider government, so are not explored in detail in this paper. In overseeing the electricity markets, one of the authority's goal is to promote prices that allocate electricity to parties that value it most highly. As mentioned, one of the most pressing review observations relates to price discrimination. In some circumstances, price discrimination can be legitimate to capture more gains from trading with consumers, and it is expected that consumers will pay different average prices for electricity if their consumption profiles differ. However, discrimination may be inefficient where some consume too little or too much relative to the value of how the electricity is used, where the benefits of consuming are less than the cost of producing, and where the market prices distort signals for future investment. Our review notes that electricity is being supplied to the smelter at prices that do not appear to be available to other consumers. These preferential terms raise questions about whether the allocation of electricity to the smelter is efficient. The TY contracts provide a potential illustration of how price discrimination in some cases may not be in the longer term interests of all consumers. The issue raised by the contracts could arise with any other large purchaser of electricity. The authority wants to consider and resolve whether policy interventions are required to address inefficient price discrimination prior to any renegotiation of the TY contracts in 2024 and any longer term contracting arrangements with other large users such as data centres or potential hydrogen plants. The authority recognises that the parties to the TY agreement agreed to these contracts given the commercial incentives that they face to deliver value to their shareholders. Our interest in the TY contracts is not part of any compliance investigation. All parties appear to have acted rationally given commercial incentives. We are using the TY contracts to illustrate the potential for an inefficiency that may be worth addressing. Similarly, the authority is not investigating breaches of competition law by participants as part of this review. The authority has its own interest in reviewing these arrangements given its competition mandate under the Electricity Act. Specific to the TY contracts, the potential efficiency costs have been estimated by the authority to be in the order of 57 million to 170 million per year if the electricity is not going to the highest value use and the value of the electricity is less than its cost. This illustrates a situation where consumers with low valued use of electricity may be consuming too much and consumers who value it more may be consuming too little and the benefits of consuming electricity are less than the cost of producing it. We are consulting on market design that may provide greater assurance that inefficient price discrimination will not occur, both with respect to the future TY contracts and in other contexts. The 
the authority has not determined that the TY contracts are inefficient. It may simply be that the smelter had a stronger negotiating position, enabling it to secure electricity at well below the prevailing prices at the time. However, there is evidence that the arrangements could be inefficient, with adverse impacts for other consumers. The contract price was below the forward prices at the time, suggesting it may be priced below alternative uses. Generators could likely have sold that electricity for a higher load-weighted average price to other parties. All generators have commercial incentives to encourage the smelter to stay, even if it means providing the smelter with preferential pricing. The contract materially impacts pricing of all electricity, given its national significance. And the contract was negotiated off-market and includes a use-it-or-lose-it clause that prevents the smelter from on-selling the electricity to other users. In our issues paper, we are seeking feedback on whether discriminatory pricing is a problem and of sufficient scale to warrant intervention. We have set out at a high level some of the policy options that we've considered that could ex be explored to address these sorts of issues that can arise. The list is not exhaustive, and there may be other approaches that en enhance the interests of consumers. The authority is considering whether interim actions are required to forestall any contracts that raise material concerns. The emphasis is on acting at pace, pursuing options that can be advanced through the code. Our focus has been on the TY contracts because of their scale and because of the observable impact on the markets. We are seeking comments on these options, both with respect to possible future contracts similar in scale to the current TY arrangements, but also in other contexts. It is also recognised that inefficient discrimination could also be happening elsewhere in the sector, including supply agreements with other large industrials or new large-scale demand in the future. In looking at these options, we are seeking to ensure electricity is provided to consumers that value it most highly and value it more than the cost of production, to promote, promote transparency and assurance to the public about the allocation of efficiency, to reduce consequences of market power, and to support price signals for investment during the transition and avoid creating un additional uncertainty. Other options could be considered, but would likely need to be considered further by other branches of government. To recap, these are complex issues. We are seeking feedback on our analysis, including the indicators we've used. The Market Monitoring Review makes several observations about the wholesale market. Elevated prices do not always match underlying supply and demand conditions. Not as many build-ready investments in renewable energy is occurring as was expected. The New Zealand aluminium smelter was offered a lower electricity price to encourage it to stay, and this may have resulted in other consumers having to pay more. Addressing the potential issues raised by the TY contracts is the first step in responding to the review. We are seeking feedback from interested parties on the issues raised and the proposed solutions. And of course, this review is part of a broader development of the wholesale market for the long-term benefits for all consumers. We welcome input from all stakeholders on the review and their, review and their views on the actions that could stem from them. The papers and information about this consultation are now, will be available on our website today, with consultation running through until Wednesday the 8th of December. After considering feedback, the authority will consult on any recommendations in early 2022. Thank you for your time this morning. Uh, we'll open for questions and answers. Thank you. Okay, uh, we've got a question from Tom Polistreka at Stuff. If you could just uh, proceed with your question. Yeah, uh, hi James. Uh, you mentioned that you had looked at the structure of the current generation market um, and that um, Meridian was uh, responsible for supplying 30% of generation uh, and meeting demand 90% of the time, increasing from 77% from in, in 2017, I think. Um, did you, uh, I mean, in mentioning that you, you looked at the structure of the market, it doesn't look as though you're looking at any, any changes to the structure of, of the market or, or the si relative size of players in the market. Is, is that correct? So the review specifically focuses in on um, market structure from a generation contribution perspective. We're not specifically looking at um, the integration of gen tailors. Uh, we're not specifically looking at uh, structural separation. The focus of the interventions uh, looking at those things that can be pursued uh, within the code. And I think uh, broader considerations may be taken by um, other government agencies, but that sits outside of our current remit.
Okay, so you you saying, for example, that if there was a decision to um, to, to rebalance the market or, or swap assets within the market, uh, that would be a decision for the government rather, rather than yourselves. So I think that's pr premature in terms of um, the observations from the review, but that would be a consideration for other parties. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. I'll just um, open further for any other questions that you may have. I appreciate that there's a lot of material to get through and the, the, the issues are complex. Uh, Bernard Hickey, could, um, could you ask a question, please? Thank you. Um, you mentioned the potential for virtual asset swaps. Can you give us a sense of what you're talking about there? Sorry, I haven't read all the reports that came through this morning. Uh, so in terms of the um, virtual asset swaps, we know that there are existing uh, swaps that are in place and due to expire. Uh, looking at some of the issues that are um, identified in terms of um, South Island uh, generation and the, um, the market power of the smelter, uh, we don't have any um, specific proposals on asset swaps as part of this consultation. And again, that would be outside of the, the remit of uh, this piece of work. So who's, who, who should be looking at that sort of thing? Is that an, is that an MB thing or um, where should it come from? Uh, so the likely uh, lead agency on that would be, uh, would be uh, MB, that's correct. And do we know if they're doing any work on this? Uh, that's not for me to comment on. Um, uh, that'd be over to, to MB to comment. I'm not aware of anything at this stage. Thank you. Thanks, Bernard. All right, um, so that brings the presentation to a close. Thank you for your time this morning, um, and we'll be engaging with stakeholders uh, in the coming weeks. Thank you.